Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. No one in the history of the world has ever tried to manage a river delta in the way that we are. A big announcement from the Water Institute as the plans of becoming a global research hub gains traction. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on our top story in a moment, but right now on the state we're in, the headlines of the week. We begin with the latest health care reform plans and how they could impact the people of our state. Senators Bill Cassidy of Louisiana and Lindsey Graham of South Carolina unveiled an alternative health care plan minutes before the GOP announced its revised bill. The Cassidy-Graham idea is to redirect much of the current funding for Obamacare to states so they can decide. The new GOP version allows the sale of cheaper, bare-bones health plans, keeps Obamacare taxes on the rich, and has big plan cuts to Medicaid. Louisiana State Health Secretary Dr. Rebecca Gee says cuts to Medicaid could doom people in our state. Often when you hear detractors of Obamacare or detractors of Medicaid, they'll say, well, what does it matter? Because no doctor will see that patient, right? Have you heard that before? That's simply not accurate. Hypertension, diabetes, substance use, mental health, you name it, we have had great success and it's made a, a difference for the lives of hundreds of thousands of families in this state. A thank you tweet to Coach O of LSU from U.S. Representative Steve Scalise. Scalise is now out of intensive care at a Washington hospital. He is being treated for infection after a number of surgeries that followed his being wounded by a gunman last month. The list of those running for state treasurer is now at five. It includes three Republicans, former state budget administrator Angel Davis, state senator Neil Reiser, and former state rep John Schroeder. There's one Democrat, New Orleans lawyer Derek Edwards, and one Libertarian, Joseph Little of Ponchatoula. State Rep. Julie Stokes, a Kenner Republican, dropped out of the race after a breast cancer diagnosis. She is now focused on chemotherapy. The good word about Toledo Bend fishing in Sabine Parish continues to spread. It earned a top five ranking among the best bass fishing lakes in the central U.S. This in addition to the number one spot for bass fishing in America the past two years. It's a big producer of double-digit pound bass. There's good news, bad news for Louisiana in a new study over wetlands loss. The good news? The federal study shows our loss has slowed a bit since 2010. No major hurricanes in the last nine years is partially why. The bad news? Researchers say the most vulnerable wetlands are already gone. Now, next week here on The State We're In, we're going to take a look at President Trump's trillion-dollar infrastructure promise and Louisiana. Our roads and bridges, we know, are troubled. That's an ongoing problem. But is the president promising too much? We'll have that story here next Friday. There's been big news this week involving the Water Campus, the lead vehicle of Louisiana Coastal Restoration announcing a new partnership. It's between the Baton Rouge-based Water Institute of the Gulf with Del Torres of the Netherlands. Governor John Bell Edwards says this partnership is critical to preserving our coast while making Louisiana a center of job-creating coastal research. The announcement shows how far the Water Institute has come in a very short time. If you're not familiar with Deltaris, they are the premier coastal and deltaic scientific organization in the world. Justin Aaronworth, CEO and president of the Water Institute, says Deltaris has been working to protect the Dutch coast for 800 years. He says this new partnership and potential merger between the Institute and the Deltaris USA operation is an enormous step toward making Louisiana and Baton Rouge the world center of global research dedicated to tackling the challenges of coastal land loss. We're doing some of the largest restoration techniques uh, that have ever been attempted in human history 
And if you're interested in this set of issues and you're on the East Coast or the West Coast, you want to be here because this is where some of the most important activity is going to be taking place. By the end of this year, the Institute will move into its new headquarters, the Center for Coastal and Deltaic Solutions, on the site of the old Baton Rouge dock. The ultra-modern structure spices up the capital city's expanding downtown and skyline, if you will. The Baton Rouge Area Foundation and Commercial Properties Realty Trust announced the plans in late 2013 and in early 2015 rolled out this presentation of what the 30-plus acres called the Water Campus would eventually look like. It would be home to restaurants, retail, residential, and thousands of new jobs. New life just south of the I-10 Mississippi River Bridge. And we'll join uh, at least two important colleagues. So LSU has uh, created a river modeling center, uh, which is uh, about, to, uh, about to be opened. And the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority has their headquarters now. The Water Institute formed in 2011 five years after a delegation of leaders from Louisiana, led by former Governor Kathleen Blanco and former Senator Mary Landrieu, first visited the Netherlands and Del Taurus and returned saying, we need what they have to save our coast. While the aftermath of Katrina forced Louisiana to find better answers, the Dutch version of Katrina happened decades before. It was the flood of 1953 that really galvanized the Dutch to think differently about how to uh, protect their coastline. Over hundreds of years, the Dutch learned to meticulously monitor and manage water levels to the best degree possible, always updating with the latest information known. They've also been proactive, where Louisiana has historically been reactive to problems. The former science director at Del Taurus said it bluntly and simply that it's a matter of survival. If Holland gets inundated, uh, our economy comes to a standstill. And it's not just a small part of the country, it's a, a very significant part of the country where, where the heart of, economy, of the economy lies. So we cannot afford to have, a, to have a flood or an inundation. Now we have come to the point that we look very far ahead and, and say, well, suppose that climate develops uh, this and that way with a certain uh, pessimistic scenario and that sea level rises according to a pessimistic scenario. What must we do in order to survive? Today, with one-third of the Netherlands below sea level, a series of dikes and barriers and massive earthen dams repel the waters of the invading North Sea. What can they learn from us and what can we learn from them? We can learn from them a tremendous amount about how to analyze and model uh, coastal challenges and, and potential solutions. Between harnessing the power of the river, uh, considering uh, diverting the river to create land, these are ecosystem restoration activities that have never been attempted on this scale. But the great thing about this partnership is that the Water Institute of the Gulf re really understand natural systems in deltas very well. They really understand water management, structures, levees and things like that, how to protect communities, drainage issues. Putting those things together means that we can really go and help people solve problems in a very holistic way. Denise Reed is the Institute's uh, Vice President for Research Initiatives. Reed has worked closely with state government in developing the 2012 and 2017 Coastal Master Plans. She says since Katrina, New Orleans has rebuilt its levees and system of barriers, and there is some progress in the attempt to regain coastal land lost. She cites the area, for example, between Port Fouchon and Grand Isle. You can go down to Elmer's Island, you can go out there on a restored beach, and, and you can really see an enormous amount of sand that not very long ago was 12 miles offshore under the water. It was picked up with a dredge, moved on shore, and put there, and, and that's really restoration at work. Reed says restoration does not necessarily mean putting the coast back together the way it was. I think that's one of the things that's really challenging to understand with this concept of restoration. It sounds like fixing an old chair or something, you know, putting a bit of varnishing on and polishing it or whatever. But really it's about thinking about what the coast can be like in the future and taking actions to give us a more sustainable future. What about when the next major hurricane strikes? Are we better prepared to handle what could come, especially New Orleans and coastal southeast Louisiana? Well, clearly around New Orleans, we have defenses that are in much better shape and they really should work as a system and hopefully they will hold 
they may overtop if the water is really deep, but they should hold and, and not be breached. And that will allow water to be pumped out of the city and things to get back to normal a whole lot more quickly. In recent weeks, the state we're in has reported in depth the problem impacting Rosa Cane. Reed says like any problem that occurs on an ever-changing coastline, it should be met head on. We worked a long time in coastal Louisiana to really chart a path forward on restoration. If this Rosa Cane bug or scale or whatever it is takes us off of that course, then we need to get on a new one as soon as we can. But let's not get distracted and go back. Now, for more information online about the Water Institute of the Gulf and the Water Campus, take a look at thewatercampus.org. Now, more than 20 close to endangered baby diamondback terrapins have returned home to a newly complete rebuilt barrier island that is in Jefferson Parish off Barataria Bay. LPB's Kelly Spires reports on what it took to make all that happen. Every day, multiple state and federal agencies, as well as private sector partners, work to counteract the forces of Mother Nature knocking away at the coast and to protect the species that live there. Thank Carrie you. Landry is an endangered species biologist with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Terrapins are a species of greatest conservation need, a state designation that's close to endangered. So terrapins are one of the only turtle species that's believed to um, exclusively inhabit uh, brackish and saltwater marshes. Um, so they, they, they use these barrier islands, they use these tidal marshes, um, they, they hang around the barrier islands and then they, they'll use the, the islands for nesting. Barrier islands form something of a wall protecting Barataria Bay, slowing wave action that knocks away marsh grasses and could ultimately mean more storm surge in Louisiana's towns and cities farther inland. Barrier islands are the, are the first uh, line of defense for storms. Um, it provides uh, a lot of protection to these really fragile marshes behind it. If we lose the, the islands and don't maintain them, then you get a larger um, impulse of water and that could you know, help erode the marshes more. But protecting from wave action means the islands are easily eroded themselves. That's why the state and federal government tried to maintain them. Donna Rogers works this for the National the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. She's the project manager for the rebuild of Chenier Ronquiel, where the turtles were released. It's three islands to the east of Grand Isle, Louisiana's only inhabited barrier island. This is Chenier Ronquiel. This is a barrier island that uh, we just finished restoring in uh, March of this year. We built Beach and Dune and uh, Back Barrier Marsh. It's about 440 acres uh, total, although there's also acreage that's underwater in, in the front slope of the beach. And terrapins aren't the only animal that calls the barrier islands home. Well, they're important to a lot of different wildlife. You have the turtles that nest, you have the birds that nest, you have the fish. When the marsh grasses get inundated, the fish come in and they use them as a nursery area. It was in the process of protecting those birds that scientists came across a surprise. Whatever sand is there that looks like it's good nesting habitat and it's in the way of construction, we have to try to keep the birds from nesting on it. It's called abatement and we put, they do all kinds of things. They put pinwheels up. Roger says her team was counting bird nests when they saw a mother terrapin nesting. They hadn't even realized terrapins were on the island. We were concerned that the turtles had, I think it was like a 60 to 80 uh, day incubation period. So we were concerned that uh, it would get in the way of construction and we, we didn't want to harm the turtles. So we worked it out with wildlife and fisheries. They came out and um, collected the eggs. That's when they called in Landry. Even without their habitat under construction, it's tough out there for a terrapin. When they hatch, they could be under an inch in diameter and they're exposed to a slew of predators, including shorebirds and fire ants. And before they hatch, their eggs are incredibly fragile. When you're moving eggs, if you roll them any way uh, than the way they were laid in the nest, it detaches, could potentially detach the embryo from the eggshell, and then the egg becomes non-viable and the, t the egg will not hatch. But LDWF doesn't have the facilities to raise 20 terrapins. For that, they turn to a pair of private citizens. Rachel and Stephen Creech own Adventure Pets, a pet store in Madisonville turned Turtle HQ for this project. Stephen was that little boy that always was catching turtles, you know, and finding them and, you know, keeping them and releasing them and all of that. And we've been married for over 35 years and he's always loved turtles. It was really exciting to me when they asked me to do it because I've always loved turtles and, you know, even I've had them all my life on and off. 
A year later, Landry is hopeful they've improved the chances of these young terrapins making it to adulthood. Now they're a year older and larger, and so they have a much better chance of surviving in the wild than they probably would have if they would have just hatched out um, on their own. But this isn't something you should do on your own. And it is best to leave wildlife in the wild, leave nest be. Um, it, it's always best to let them um, do their own thing naturally. And hopefully these terrapins will be able to teach the state something about their species. Before they were released, Landry systematically marked their shells, markings that should remain in the shell even as the terrapin grows. We'll be able to see down the road, hopefully, if they survive and if we are able to trap them in the future, um, you know, then we can kind of get all that data on them. For LPB, I'm Kelly Spires. Kelly, thank you so much for that report. Voting in the PBS Online Film Festival begins on Monday, July 17th. We're going to have more about that in just a minute. But first, we are previewing the two short films from Louisiana nominated by PBS. Last week, we showed you Last Light. Now, a look at the second short film. It is named Sigh by Samantha Smith. Filmmaker Samantha Smith describes her short, Sigh, as the little film that could. It's four minutes, 35 seconds long. It won Best Short Film and Best Photography Direction at the Kids Festival in Madrid. Sigh is a temperamental six-year-old who gets a goldfish from her parents after begging for a puppy. No! That's not fair! I need a puppy! Or, or, I'm going to die! Oh, I'm already dead! Smith's little film that could is short on dialogue and selective on color. Everything in Sai's room is white, from the walls to the record player on her shelf to the record itself. Breaking the one color theme, Sai and her muted orange dress, which matches the color of the fish. The goldfish may not be the pet she wanted, but it sends her imagination places a puppy probably would not have. Or is it only her imagination? Get set to watch Psy and Last Light, along with the other shorts nationwide in the PBS Online Film Festival. Now, you can see that once again, it begins on July 17th. That is this coming up Monday. You'll have that time period to go online, watch the films, vote, and share your favorite indie short film. You see the first film, big film, shot in Louisiana in 1917. Now, right now, we are in studio, have two of the leaders of the Louisiana film industry with us. Uh, we are a long ways from the days back in 2013 and 2014 when filmmaking was booming in our state. That was before a cap was put on the film tax credits. That ushered in a tough year, tough period for people in the state. The legislature has just adjusted that. So I want to welcome Patrick Mulhern, film executive, formerly of Celtic Media, and of course, the executive director of Louisiana Entertainment, Chris Stelly. All right, let's talk right now about what was done this summer and what just went into effect, uh, and that is the new version of the cap in Louisiana. Right, Chris? right. You know, the film program has evolved into something that once again puts Louisiana in a position to be a trailblazer. A lot of great things happening in that new program, in the new program that we're administering right now, um, from, it, it, you know, all built on the back of typical production activity. So we were focused, uh, this program, on really three basic concepts. One, supporting our lo local Louisiana content creators, permanent jobs for Louisiana residents, and of course, typical production that we've seen over the course of the few years. Okay, now Patrick, uh, you were with Celtic uh, during the years that things really mm -hmm. escalated. You didn't have enough space uh, <laughs> to produce films. Right. And then things changed, and they changed when uh, the first cap process was put into place. Mm -hmm. uh, and what did that do briefly, and the change now, what does this open up having uh, the adjustment that the legislature has made? Right, well we certainly saw our share of peaks and valleys and the, the lowest valley happened because of what happened uh, in the legislature in 2015, where essentially the state of Louisiana said we're gonna make an unlimited number of promises to the film industry, but we're only gonna keep a certain amount per year. And that brought a lot of just, again, 
uh, instability. Well, it drove um, people away. Right. You didn't know when the state of Louisiana would actually honor its obligations. And so when you've got competition out there that you can, you know, set your watch by, then um, it just seemed like Louisiana wasn't the, the best place to, to make a film. So um, what this legislation did is it brought that back. Um, and, and again, kind of streamlined some things. It uh, sort of made it to where uh, again, you've got a program that you can bank on in the future. So just to make it as simple as can be, uh, there is a cap on the front end, which sort of lets people know what's available and what's happening. But also they kept the cap on the back end, which is confusing. <laughs> it, it is a little bit. Um, and I think it's good just to kind of put things in perspective of where we are. You have a state like Georgia, which has an unlimited no cap program. As we did before. That's right. And they're now at the point where they're over 600 million a year, which a lot of people think is probably not sustainable. Um, then you've got uh, a, a program like New York that's 420 million a year, but that's capped on the front end. And then you've got California, which is a $330 million a year program, which is again capped on the front end. Louisiana was at 180 on the back end with no cap on the front. Right. Now it's at 150 on the front with 180 on the back. So that the state of Louisiana knows it will never exceed more than 180 million per year. So Chris, let me ask you, uh, with that in mind, how many tax credits do we have left say for this year and when, what films are in the pipeline? Well, we haven't started issuing any credits under the new program uh, under the $150 million issuance cap as of today. We've only received two applications, which is okay. pretty typical. We, we were ready to roll July 1. We're getting a lot of calls. So, so we're still closing out a lot of old projects, pre-July 1, 2017 applications. Um, but, you know, to speak to what Patrick was saying, uh, this new program really builds up that stability and so hopefully those valleys that we see will maintain a level that is going to be sustainable well into the future. I do know that uh, talking to some of the, uh, the lead actors on some of the short films that mm -hmm. we've had, they also do a lot of other work, they've been told by their agents to stand by, there is work coming. Mm -hmm. So is that, to me, that tells them that, okay, things are happening here. Absolutely. Is that what you're finding? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got season two of, of Claws coming in. We've got season three of Queen Sugar coming in. Uh, a Hulu series is currently ramping up to start filming. Um, so we've got a lot on the books right now. We're starting to see, uh, you know, again, garnish a lot of calls as we get through the summer slow season, which is typical during mm -hmm. this time of the year. People are taking vacations. The studios are going in and, and reevaluating their fall and winter slates. So we're starting to... to you know, again, start seeing that confidence in the state of Louisiana, and that's taken, uh, you know, taken a couple of years, and people know that we're going to deliver on our promises right. and that we're going to honor our commitments, and we've uh, been been really consistent at doing that. I know one of the questions uh, people had was that, okay, well, they're doing some of the filming here, but the final production is in California, so it doesn't go all the way through with people having work, and it doesn't necessarily ensure work or the outlying work that can come from it. Patrick, I, I don't know what you would say about that, but uh, I, I know there was a drop off in work, so that was obvious, uh, but what about now? Well, you know, there, there's a lot to like about the bill, and let's just start with how it passed. Yeah. It passed by a vote, I think, of 89 to eight in the House yeah. and 33 to Which three in the good. Senate, yeah. and, it. and it extended it through 2025. Okay, so that really gives you this confidence that Louisiana is in this for the long haul, um, and, you know, again, we're committed to the industry and not going to pull the rug out from underneath you. So you can plant roots. And so scripted television is now a huge focus of it. If you can put in an application for a scripted TV series, it's good for five years. Um, uh, you know, I think yeah. the, what you can earn as a scripted television series is actually more than more you can than earn for a feature correct, film now. Correct. And um, there's just a lot to love yeah. about it. I mean, there's even yeah. an additional incentive for venturing outside of New Orleans and yeah. shooting uh, uh, throughout the rest of the state. Right. It's great to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. And is. for Louis local Louisiana screenwriters, you get yes. an additional credit for that. So, so, you know, going back to what you said earlier, we recognized very early on in the process that we went through late last year and early this year that Louisiana was missing out on a sure. tremendous amount of permanent jobs within the value stream. So, so we still focus on production, but now we have what's called a qualified entertainment company that focuses on the, the companies that are involved in the process, a distribution company, for example, where now we have a tool that we can go out and attract right. a company that originally wasn't part of the production credit. But So now Louisiana, like I said earlier, we're, we're blazing another trail that All I'm right. certain other states will start to mimic it's as they mimic ours. Christelli, so. 
Patrick Mulhern, very good to see you both and update us on what is happening in uh, Louisiana, awesome. the film industry. Great to be we can call ourselves Hollywood South again, I guess. Uh. <laughs> All right, this week on Louisiana Postcard, an up-close look at the many birds of Louisiana all over the state. It's a video essay by photographer Rex Q. Fortenberry. Beautiful scenery, beautiful birds of Louisiana. Did you or a family member or someone you know serve in the Vietnam War? Well, if so, LPB wants to preserve and share the story. Every Wednesday, LPB invites you to our studios in Baton Rouge to record your Vietnam experience. You can also share your history with us of videos, photos, and written stories that you might have at lpb.org slash forward slash Vietnam. To learn more about scheduling an interview, go to our website or simply call us at 225-767-4204. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. It's easy to do. The download is free from your app store. And on there, you can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And also, be sure to like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.